confession to make about a Saturday morning indulgence that my son and I have undertaken. We've been watching reruns of Robert Conrad and um, and and his and uh, Ross Martin at uh, doing Wild Wild West, James West and Artemis Gordon reruns from the '60s. Um, my brothers and I used to love watching the Wild Wild West when we were kids. And one of the things that the Wild Wild West would do um, is when they were getting ready for a commercial break at a particularly dramatic moment of the episode, they would freeze the picture of the villain or the picture of James West knocked out on the floor. They would freeze it and turn it into kind of a sepia-toned image and then break for commercial. And you'd learn about Kellogg's Corn Flakes or, you know, whatever it was, cool cigarettes, which they were hawking at the time. And um, the picture would come back, and you'd see the image of the old scene, and you'd remember that that's what happened. Well, there's a little bit of that this morning, because we pick up the old scene. Uh, Jesus is addressing the folks in uh, Nazareth, and he starts by saying, this news has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, that's from the previous week as part of the previous week's writing. But they use it as a sort of a sepia-toned remembrance of this. And so I'll give you a little bit of information on what had happened. See, Jesus, just to remember where we are, the villain, uh, are, no, where we are, Jesus is at his hometown in Nazareth. And he's returned from his being abroad, preaching in Galilee and teaching in Galilee and doing all sorts of things that his hometown has been hearing about. And they invite him back to do the readings in the synagogue that morning. Local boy comes home to read at church. And he reads, just to remind you what he reads, he reads a piece from, from Isaiah. And it is, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, we know that he's filled with the Spirit because at the very beginning of that last week's passage, Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, went to Nazareth. And he says that all this stuff is <clears throat> fulfilled in his speaking. That's where we pick up after the commercial break. He says, basically, this bit of good news that I just rel related to you all Release, recovery of sight, freedom, my proclamation enacts all of them. And so those gathered around him, listening, are impressed that this local boy makes good, who they once knew as Joseph's son, has become this eloquent, eloquent rabbi. I remember once I was preaching at a service. My aunt and uncle were in attendance. It was the first time they'd heard me preach. Um, it was actually a burial service of a family m member, and Uncle George leaned over to Aunt Lynn, Linda and said, Oh, who knew? I could listen to that guy read the shopping list. Very proud. Very sort of stopped in his tracks by uh, his young nephew uh, preaching in the church. And the people of Nazareth must have thought, This is really good. We know this guy. We know our scriptures, and they remind us that we're chosen by God. Pat us off, ourselves on the back. Someday, baby, we're going to see it all. And he's just told us that now's the time. What a wonderful day to be in church, he, they must have thought. Hoorah! Now, if Jesus had stopped there and had sat down and gone to coffee hour afterwards, they would have thought, this is great. But you see, he'd warned them. Let this be a warning to anybody that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And once the Spirit is upon somebody, look out, because no telling what's going to happen. We remember at his baptism, the Holy Spirit had revealed itself to Jesus. Remember, we read that a couple of weeks ago. As he prayed and was trying to get his head around the job that lay ahead for him, the Holy Spirit came out like a dove and descended. Jesus does not have an easy job ahead of him. He's going to need the Holy Spirit to help him. He's going to be preaching and teaching against imperial powers of the Roman occupation and the very temple authority itself. And what he had seen, all of that stuff become, all those 
pious leaders in the temple focusing on their gestures and their traditions, which were overshadowing any sense of care for the vulnerable. And Jesus was being called to speak out against it. He'd been deputized, like Jeremiah in our reading this morning, to speak truth to power, to go beyond what's expected of rabbis. Now I can hear the folks in Nazareth saying, Go on, Jesus. Show us something that will make us proud. Show us one of your tricks that you've been doing in Capernaum. You speak well. Why don't you show us something? So Jesus takes a deep breath and continues. Now, nearly a thousand years earlier, Jeremiah had done the same thing. He would needed convincing that he was qualified to speak boldly, having been consecrated by God to do this, but also knowing that he was a newbie, just a boy. Nonsense, God says. I know you more than you know yourself. Before you were in your mother's womb, and I'm going to help you. I am, after all, your rock and your salvation. I'm your castle to keep you safe, your crag and your stronghold. The psalmist even told you that. God will give God's prophets the words and the courage to have the audacity to speak up and to speak out. So Jesus takes a deep breath. The words that followed in that Nazareth synagogue corrected whatever picture these folks around him had in their minds about what he was saying. His was a message of hope, indeed, yes, restoring hope, releasing hope, redeeming hope. But Jesus offers this broadly, not just to those hometown folks, not even just to the Jewish people, the ones who were chosen by God, but to those who were outside the realm, the so-called others. Listen, he says, about that good stuff I just mentioned, remember that God also likes outsiders. God sent Elijah to feed outsiders, a poor Lebanese widow. God sent Elisha to cure outsiders, the general of an invading army. When famines and leprosy outbreaks happen, God just might ignore Jewish people and help other people. Jesus' message proclaimed restoration, release, and redemption to everyone and especially to those who were others in the eyes of the establishment. You see, in Jesus' eyes, chosen by God isn't exclusive. It's actually inclusive. You're chosen. You're chosen. You're chosen. We're all chosen. That obviously was a radical direction, and it changed the mood of that congregation considerably, and they threw, went, went to throw him off a cliff. Now, just as an aside, Nazareth is not on a cliff. The town is actually built, I think, on a, on a plain, maybe even between two hills. But maybe those folks had lofty ideals of where they were, sitting high on a hilltop. And so they wanted to throw them off the cliff. Now, how would we at St. Michael's Church react to this kind of course correction by Jesus, setting us up to think one thing and then saying, by the way, I'm not talking only about you all. I'm talking about other folks. Who are the others that Jesus wanted to remind us about? Well, one path might say that it's the folks that we like to reach out to when we act faithfully in God, as God's hands and feet in the world. The folks who St. Michael's, I believe, would welcome into our household. Folks we will encounter, for example, at Common Cathedral, this afternoon after church when we take food down there and distribute it and worship alongside the unhoused community there or the folks that we bring food to at Monday lunch program each month at the cathedral itself or whenever we get back to visiting Safe Passage in Guatemala City. The folks that we learn about when we learn about the City Plaza Hotel in Athens that housed Syrian refugees or the folks who spend their summers at Be Safe, or when we learn about Afghanistan and what's happening in the Middle East, or folks with whom we try to reach across racial or ethnic or economic divides in order to connect and build God's dream. But we certainly aren't othering these different groups. I mean, after all, we make food and we share it. We visit young students in their country and we learn about their school. 
We fill blessing bags for people who are unhoused, and we do all this stuff face to face and on the, their turf, not on our turf. And we send money when we can't be there in person. We collect and drop off books for prison libraries. And we put food in refrigerators for people who have food insecurity. We just delivered a whole bunch of stuff this past weekend. Books and food. We try to gather in relationship and we reach out to try and connect. So what if Jesus still says to us, guess what? God will reach beyond you to the folks that you exclude. But wait, Jesus, we want to say, we, we don't exclude. We embrace. Isn't this, isn't this message for folks who are actively antisocial, crabby, self-centered, and like to think piously that they're favored by God and that God will attend to the others who are not part of their household? We understand that. Everyone's welcome here. After all, our household isn't exclusive. Is this passage relevant to an active, progressive, liberal church like St. Michael's? Let's think about who it is who may be proclaimed by Jesus and who Jesus is saying that God will step over us to help. Maybe you know folks in your life that society at one point has labeled deplorables and who today still cannot shake that oppressive notoriety. Maybe they are feeling outcast to an otherwise polite society. Maybe it's folks who don't see the world the way you do because for whatever reason they've lost the image of what is important about their country to them or even lost the image of what's important about themselves, and they feel isolated. Maybe it's those who are held captive, not by systems of injustice and oppression, but held captive by their careers, or their rank, or their appetites <clears throat> for things which they grasp in order to find meaning in their lives, and for which they may feel derided by polite society. Maybe those whose spirits feel vacant and who feel impoverished despite a seemingly full life and who, who maybe are dying slowly from that form of poverty. Good news to the poor, release to the captives, sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed. Perhaps... That's a different kind of message to a different group of people than we might expect. Perhaps some here at St. Michael's sit quietly apart, not just social distancing, but sit quietly apart in their spirit, in their sense of being welcomed, <clears throat> because perhaps they fall into one of those categories. Maybe the labels, the lost vision, the captivity by earthly appetites, the poverty of spirit, all lead towards a death of sorts for folks who, have would, who would otherwise have been seen as con conventional. Yet they hold different priorities, different ways of being, different politics than you or than me. St. Michael's is a wonderful community, a beautifully progressive community. And in that, I wonder if there are quiet separations which we reveal when we speak comfortably about who and what is right and about who and what is not. Lifting a voice that may serve to shush or silence folks who feel that they are being othered. That's a word, othered. Would you resent Jesus making his proclamation on their behalf? saying that God will reach beyond you and bring life to them. God will touch them and lift them up. Speaking quite honestly, I might say, well, I can think of some I would feel a little bit resentful to think that, but that's my stuff and that's my work. Part of the beauty of Christian community is the claim that we are each vital members of the body of Christ. None is greater, 
None is worse. No one is anointed more or less than another. We needn't like the behavior or details of everyone we meet or of everyone we read about. After all, people are complex, and behavior expresses that complexity, sometimes very fully or with great articulation. But God wants abundant life for all and release from what brings death. And I pray God will bring that release for each of us. Paul reminds us that leading with love is ultimately an act of transforming all relationships, all interactions, everything offered and received, from merely noise and clatter into music. Indeed, into the language that allows true and beloved community. May we continue our path that dares us to speak up truth to power and to speak boldly and in love and to walk humbly in love as Christ loves us. Amen. Amen.